Good morning, everyone. My name is Maya Luria with TMC for Seniors. And today we're going to talk about sleep and the power of sleep. I have David Scholes here with me. He is our TMC Neurodiagnostics Manager of the TMC Sleep Center, where he helps, um, he and his staff help our patients to get to the root of the sleeping problems. Today, he's going to be presenting for us on the topic of sleep, its importance, and especially in our active aging population. Welcome, David. Thank you. So, so David, I'm going to go ahead. You do have an online audience today, along with a very large audience in person. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. And afterwards, I'll come back up and ask you any questions that come in from our online audience. Very good. Hello, everyone. I'm David Schulz. I'm the manager of TMC Sleep Diagnostics. My presentation today is just going to give you kind of a background of what sleep medicine is, some sleep disorders, kind of what we can do to improve our sleep hygiene, and then open it up to you guys to ask some questions that you might have specifically around your sleep needs. Normal sleep is broke down to five stages of sleep. Stage one is kind of like that drowsy, boring part of a movie type of sleep. A lot of people are watching television or your head drops or whatnot, that is stage one. Stage two is where you're gonna spend the majority of your sleep throughout the night. Um, stage two, it's well rested sleep. Like I said, a majority of your night is gonna be stay, um, staying in stage two sleep. Stage three and four sleep is deep sleep. If you've ever known anybody that has been a sleep walker or a sleep talker, that occurs during these stages of sleep. REM sleep, what everybody seems to come to the sleep laboratory saying, I'm, I'm not getting restful sleep, I'm not getting enough of my REM sleep. That's what usually what they um, read about literature. Although REM sleep is very important, it's the only stage of sleep that is the closest to being awake, but still being asleep. So if anybody has actually had maybe a song um, enter your dream, um, maybe through a clock radio or an alarm clock or something like that. That's why, because you're so light in sleep, in REM sleep, it can be incorporated into your dreams. REM sleep is the only stage of sleep where dreaming occurs. The only two muscles that work in your body during REM sleep are your eyes for the rapid eye movement sleep and your diaphragm. Circadian rhythms. That's pretty much what human beings and other mammals are based on. It's when your brain tells you to be awake and when your brain tells you to be asleep. And the hypothalamus in your brain is what creates that biological clock. As it starts to, the sun goes down and as your, um, it gets later in the day, your brain and the circadian rhythm will start to tell you that it's time to prepare yourself for sleep. Your metabolism starts to slow down. Uh, melatonin starts to create in your brain and you start to get sleepy. Important factors of the circadian rhythm is it's stimulated by daylight activity, um, sunlight as well. It's important during daylight hours for you to be out and about and as active as you can be, and that will prepare you for sleep time. Um, a lot of people that live sedentary lifestyles are not able to move as much. It's really hard for them to, and your brain, and that circadian rhythm to be um, kept up on is where they're keeping up late hours at night then it's difficulty to stay during stay up during the day and then fall asleep. Um, the other thing back to um, circadian rhythms, um, traveling over time zones is what can interrupt that circadian rhythm. For my staff that are sleep techs that are historically supposed to be awake at night and then sleep during day, it is possible to sweep, switch your circadian rhythm where your brain tells you to sleep during the day and be awake at night it is possible but you would need to maintain that you can't flip flop back and forth throughout the same week and feel that your rest is going to be as restful um, your sleep cycles happen about every 90 minutes once you fall asleep and it's um the main word that i use here is uninterrupted so if you're able to fall asleep and then stay asleep their sleep cycles average every 90 minutes and it'll take about 60 to 90 minutes to enter that first period of REM sleep, that dream sleep, and then it'll start over. 
the one uh, caveat that I want to mention on this slide is that if you're doing really well, you fall asleep without too much trouble, you go to sleep, you're um, sleeping pretty restful, and then all of a sudden the dog comes in or barks or needs to be let out, you don't necessarily start in that stage of sleep that you arose in. Okay, so if you're in stage two sleep, the dog needs to go out, you let, then you start back over. So now if we incorporate that into snoring or maybe some pain control issues, you're having some back trouble and that interrupts your sleep, then you're not gonna get to those deeper stages of sleep. And it's the most um, disjointed and consolidated sleep that we get is when it's uninterrupted. So that's what our goal is. One of the most common questions I get, especially with my staff at the sleep lab here at TMC, is how much sleep do I need? There's not this magic number that I tell patients that you need. Literature supports that the average amount of sleep that the adult needs is somewhere between eight and nine hours of sleep. And that is back to uninterrupted sleep um, that you're able to achieve all stages of sleep and get some restful quality sleep. Um, the one thing that I wanted to make mention to on this particular slide is uh, a lot of people, if you have a busy um, week scheduled, if you have appointments, um, maybe you're traveling and that's seven and a half to nine hours of sleep that you're getting um, is impacted by that and you're late to go to bed, then you contribute to what we call a sleep debt. And you're and more commonly in the workforce where people are working or like I said, living busy schedules, they always say, well, I'll just make up for it on the weekend. You know, I'll sleep in later. I'll catch up on my sleep for the average one night of sleep deprivation. It takes three days to make up for that one night of sleep deprivation. So it's impossible to make up on a standard Saturday, Sunday, sleep in a little later. A more appropriate technique would be for you to, um, if you are traveling or you get to bed late, you watch a show um, that uh, puts you to bed later than your normal, is to that next night, go to bed a little bit early, maybe a half an hour, an hour before, and try to get make up your sleep debt. It is possible to erase that sleep debt if you've had a busy week. Does that make sense? Um, on a private note, my dad um, was military for many, many years, kept the same schedule for um, woke up at five o'clock every morning, worked, came home, went to bed at the same time. That's the way he raised me. Um, he retired. He says, David, um, I don't sleep as good as I used to. And I'm like, well, what time do you go to bed? He goes, well, whatever time I want, I'm retired. <laughs> I said, well, what time, you know, what time do you wake up? And he goes, well, your mom gets up, you know, and this, that, the other. So I'll get up with her sometimes. Sometimes she's tired, so I'll just stay in bed and I'll sleep. I said, well, you know, are you guys doing stuff late in the evening? You know, and he goes, well, if your mom wants to watch the show, then sometimes we'll stay up till midnight or something. And I get into that good book and then I'll just stay up and then I'll just sleep till, till when? And he goes, well, whenever, you know, 10, 11, 12 o'clock noon. Dad, you got to keep a schedule, and and he's like, ah, that's hogwash. You don't you don't know. And I'm like, this is what I do for a living. And I'm like, Dad, I might know something. <laughs> and he's like, all right, you know, I'm 48 years old. He still calls me boy. He goes, oh boy, I'll, I, okay, thanks, love you. I'll, I'll. A year later, he comes back. He goes, I'm still not sleeping real good. So we incorporated some of these suggestions that I'm talking to you about. Now he's sleeping better. So. Um, it sounds like, and I always try to empower the patient is, um, if you happen to be diagnosed with maybe a sleep disorder, something like um, sleep apnea or PLMs where you move your legs at night, that's really something you can't control. But this is something you can't control what time you go to bed, what time you wake up, trying to keep a normal routine, being as active as you can during the day, and that's all gonna contribute to your restful sleep at night. Control those things, maybe keep a little diary, see, yeah, you know, I did those things that David said, and I actually did sleep pretty well that night. And then just prove it to yourself, you know, be an advocate for your own sleep and your own health. Artificial sleep. So unfortunately, um, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, 
uh, many, many medications have been uh, marketed as sleep aids is what we'll call them. And although I'm not a big proponent of being having someone being put on a sleep aid, they are intended and have good use for temporary use. Unfortunately, some patients that have put on sleep aids are on them for many, many years and sometimes 20, 30 years is what we're seeing. So I caution you is that um, I'm not anti sleep aids. Um, they have a purpose, but it is to try to figure out what's going on, why you're not sleeping naturally on your own. Uh, many years ago, the most uh, common or popular um, diagnose or person that was diagnosed with artificial sleep that led into um, his death was Michael Jackson. I don't know how much of you heard about what led up to his bizarre behavior and the use of propofol that he was needing to be used because he was having excessive pain and then he wasn't sleeping because of the medication. So they, his physician put him on propofol, which is an anesthetic, and then he didn't wake up. And But leading up to that, for someone like my, my field and my point of view, was that there was bizarre behavior leading up to that because he was, even though he was asleep, it was artificial sleep. And then he had bizarre behaviors, he wasn't himself. And if someone had noticed that, then maybe the outcome would have been a little different. So I take this moment at this point that if your physician puts you on a sleep aid and you notice anything bizarre about your normal behavior, sleep eating, sleep driving, um, bizarre behavior up and walking around, please bring that to the attention of your physician to prescribe the medication. That's not normal. That's not an, a normal side effect. It's dangerous. I have a buddy of mine years ago, um, we went to school together and whatnot, and he said, you know, I've been having trouble sleeping. And I said, did you go talk to your physician? He said, yeah, he gave me this, these medications and I take this pill and then I get pretty good restful sleep. I said, well, you should probably have a sleep study. Let's get to the bottom of it, see what's going on. So get you off those medicines and then maybe you get some better restful sleep. Well, he didn't listen to me. We got together, we were starting to talk. And he said, you know, I had something really strange happen to me the other day. I said, oh, what happened? And he said, um, I got in the car to go to work, in my truck. And I saw that there was a receipt down on my seat for Whataburger, but I don't remember going to Whataburger. And he looked at the receipt and he saw the time and it was three o'clock in the morning. And I said, did you take your medicine to go to sleep? And he said, yeah. I said, how many did you take? He said, well, I took two pills instead of one. And so he drove himself there, bought a meal, didn't get in an accident, come back, ate the meal, doesn't remember anything. I said, you really need to talk to your doctor. I said, that's not normal. It's dangerous. You're going to get hurt. He didn't listen to me. A couple of months later, same type of situation happened, but he ran his truck into a light pole. He was asleep. Okay. The reason that I'm telling you this is to really to educate anybody that I can about it because he didn't think it was a valid problem. He, he trusted his doctor as he should. He was using the medication majority as, a, as instructed. However, he had side effects and had these bizarre behaviors that had he brought it to someone's attention, we could have switched the medication. We're not saying that you don't need a sleep aid. That just wasn't the right one for him, like anything. Okay. If you have a medication that you're using for your blood pressure and you start to have side effects, your physician will put you on a different medication. Be an advocate for your health, especially if those bizarre, dangerous behaviors are coming up. Um, we've had children that were on similar situations that are eating tubs of butter. Um, the sleep eating that I'm talking about, they would just go in and just eat things that unconventionally you wouldn't eat, just tubs of butter, and they are technically still asleep. So that's where I wanted to use this slide to uh, to bring to your attention. The other caveat to that that I want to mention is that there is no perfect sleep medication. Okay? They are all medications that were marketed for a certain purpose, and when they trialed those medications, the side effect was that everybody was having trouble staying asleep or staying awake. They were falling asleep. They were drowsy. So then they changed the marketing and made them sleep aids. Once you 
become used to that medication, it requires more and more of that medication to get that side effect, like any medication. So speak with your physicians if they happen to prescribe it. This is not trying to get you to think that sleep medications, just document it, be well aware of your surroundings, listen to your body. If something like this happened, bring it to their attention and they can switch it to where you're not having those side effects. Sleep hygiene, and this section is not necessarily um, brushing your teeth before bed. Um, it's behaviors that lead into good quality restful sleep that some, are, some patients may or may not realize are important. Um, television negatively affects the depths of your sleep. Uh, Harvard did a white paper years ago about blue light. And blue light is that light that's emitted from television, your cell phones, laptops, um, tablets, and it, they did a study that showed that that blue light significant, significantly reduces the excretion of melatonin in your brain. Melatonin is what I spoke of earlier that convinces you that it's time to go to bed. So if the blue light is inhibiting your ability to go to sleep by decreasing your production of melatonin, you may have difficulty because it is stimulating your brain. You are more wide-eyed and you are then um, prolonging your ability to fall asleep. So we really want to turn those televisions off and whatnot prior to bedtime. At least one and a half, two hours is generally what I'm seeing. I know what you're going to say. Some people need noise. Some, some people live on a busy street. It blocks out maybe the ambulances or traffic. You're better off using maybe like a fan or they have lots of white noise machines that play um, waves and, and soothing music. You're better off with that than the television because if anybody has fallen asleep watching TV, you realize that volume level goes up and down periodically with commercials and different shows. And that can cause what we call a K-complex in your brain where you may not open your eyes and arouse, but your brain is alerting you. And that's that K-complex that we're talking about. And earlier I talked about how you need to progress to those deeper stages of sleep. Those K-complexes keep happening. It'll keep you in those lighter stages of sleep. You won't go into that deep sleep because of the noise of the television. It'll just keep you right there in stage one, stage two sleep. And that'll be light. You'll be asleep, but you'll wake up not feeling very rested. Um, of course, limiting your meals and caffeine three to four hours prior to bedtime. Um, I do know patients that come and try to, to be right. They're like, David, I can drink a cup of coffee right before bed and go to bed, and I have no problem. My grandma was that way. She could always drink. I used to drink coffee with her. She'd go to bed. She'd never have any trouble sleeping. However, there are those patients that do have trouble. So we're bringing it to your attention is that caffeine can keep you up, difficulty turning your brain off. Um, so definitely think about that. The heavy meals also, because then you're having to get up, toilet more often. Maybe you have heartburn, you can get into that where then that's difficult to fall asleep. So we want to make sure that your meal is happening earlier in the day. If you are someone that exercises, anytime you raise your core body temperature, your body is going to have to return and, and to that normal temperature. So try not to exercise right up before bedtime because that's another thing that your brain. We talked about that circadian rhythm where your metabolism and your core body temperature starts to slow down. It's trying to convince you it's time for bed. But if you go and maybe do a walk right before bed or whatnot, or maybe you have a home gym and your body temperature, you're going to need to allow yourself to go to return to that um, body temperature before you go to bed. So just have that realistic expectation. I'm not telling you not to do those things, but if you want to go to bedtime at say nine o'clock, maybe work out at six or seven and not eight o'clock and then get frustrated because maybe you're not falling asleep. Make sense? And then obviously, if you're gonna nap, try to keep those naps at a minimum. Daytime napping should be limited at 20 or so minutes. If you sleep longer than that, then that circadian rhythm and that cycle that I talked about will then interrupt that nocturnal sleep time. So you've been sleeping stage one, stage two, stage three, you're getting into REM sleep, and then it'll take over. And then when you go back to sleep at nighttime, it's gonna start that all over and it's gonna have difficulty because your brain says, well, I was just in dream sleep 
and it'll keep you in those lighter stages of sleep. So you really want to minimize those naps to maybe only 20, 30 minutes if you need to nap. And then obviously try to do that earlier in midday instead of right up to bedtime. Aging and sleep. As the population gets older, as we all do, um, we need to have a realistic expectation that it, your sleep is going to change. Um, I mentioned my dad earlier because he's, he's a good, good, healthy subject because he doesn't listen to me, but he also has taught me a lot about what um, someone like yourselves who are dealing with sleep. And um, he's like, you know, I, I used to just, he could sleep on a picnic table. We go camping or hunting or whatever we do. And he could sleep anytime. And then now as he got older, he just, he's got the aches and pains. He's had cancer a couple times. He's got a lot of things that he's dealing with and he's just, I just can't sleep. I can't turn my brain off. And so I, I've tried to get him to realize that you need to have a real expectation that you're probably going to wake up more. You're probably not going to get that um, consolidated sleep that you're used to when you were in your forties and your fifties. And that's realistic. And then once you've taken that pressure off of it and you realize, okay, I might have to sleep. I might have to stay in bed a little bit longer to get my quality sleep and that's okay. Then I think people plan better. They schedule their sleep time better. And then I think that then you get the rest that you need. I always like to point out on this that there's a difference between rest and sleep. And the best way that you can go about getting rest is to create an environment that's restful. I mentioned my grandmother years ago about the, the, um, about the coffee. But coffee, coffee and warm, it gets kind of soothing. It, it's, it, it creates a good, comfortable feeling and it allowed her to relax, okay? Um, pets, although they bring comfort, they can interrupt your sleep. I had a patient once, I did a talk years ago, and we kind of went off on a pet subject. And I said, well, where does your cat sleep? And she says, well, right on my head. <laughs> and I go, do, do you want her there? The cat? <laughs> and she goes, well, that's where she seems to be the most comfortable. <laughs> And I said, well, was that comfortable for you? She goes, no, not so much. I'm like, well, maybe that's why you're having trouble sleeping because this cat's right here. I had another gentleman, a young guy, um, similar, 30, 35, I think. And he said, I cannot sleep unless I have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich before bed. Every, I have to have that. So me being a science major that grew up, you know, studying science and I was like, what's in peanut butter? You know, is there something that is like, you know, like turkey and tryptophan and all that stuff? Is there something about that? And then I was like, well, tell me about your history. Tell me about your upbringing. Was like, well, my mom always made me peanut butter and jelly sandwich before I bed. Remember earlier we talked about those routines and then now I'm introducing comfort that's more what I think had to do with it was that it was a more of a routine that brought him comfort and it just became a habit. And, and, and he believed that that's what it was. And it just made, and his mom had since passed and it just brought welcome memories and things and allowed him to turn his brain off and give him comfort. And then goes to bed and then be able to go and get rest. So I like to take this moment to talk about the, the comfort piece, temperature of the room, multiple blankets, um, my wife, she's huge on clean sheets. She's like, we're going to sleep so good tonight. We have clean sheets. <laughs> I'm just being honest. And I'm like, really? And I mean, I get in there and I'm like, look, that's nice. I don't have any problem sleeping, but, but she's like, yeah. I and mean, she says, so whatever gives you comfort for a good night's sleep, be the, be your own advocate, you know? It's okay to put the dog outside and let them let themselves out. You don't have to sleep with you if you feel like the dog is interrupting your sleep. Um, routines, structure, that's going to help you get through those times when something's out of the ordinary. Maybe you have a stress in your life, but your brain will take over because of that routine, and then you'll be able to rest. Um, obviously, getting up as we get older, um, having to use the toilet one not so toileting prior to bedtime is helpful and and definitely helps um, those longer periods of time before maybe you have to get up mid mid sleep this is just a nice little histogram where it talks about um, 
aging and sleep. So the, the time off to the left is the minutes of sleep, your age as it progresses, and then the stages that we talked about. WAZO is an acronym that we use in sleep medicine that stands for wake after sleep onset. So you can see that the time that you wake up after you initially fall asleep does get into a majority more amount of time when you're younger. When you're younger, you can generally fall asleep and then stay asleep until the morning. As we get older that period of time, you, it is realistic for you to actually wake up and it take 10, 15, 20 minutes or more to go back to sleep. Generally, what I tell my, my patients is if, if you haven't fallen back to sleep in 15 minutes or so, it's better to get yourself up out of bed, go do something, maybe get into the room, um, read a book, a magazine, something short, not something that's going to take several hours. And then as you start to get drowsy again, then go and put yourself back to bed. You're, be you're better off doing that and then to be able to achieve more sleep. Again, the decrease of REM sleep. We talked about dream sleep. The one thing that I'm gonna did a mention that I've learned from other patients is they'll come into the lab or they'll, they'll call me on the phone and they'll say, I don't remember my dreams. I think there's a problem. I'm not getting dream sleep. So actually, if you're sleeping well in quality, you should not remember your dreams. Just putting it out there. The only time you remember your dreams is if you wake up in the middle of the dream. Something. The alarm clock goes off, which nobody has alarm clocks, but if your phone goes off, or like I said, if the dog wakes you up, um, whatever the circumstances, there's a, a, you know, a noise outside in the house, whatnot, and that wakes you up, then you'll remember your dream. If you transition through those cycles normally, you should transition out of that dream sleep and back into stage one, stage two, you won't remember that dream. Okay. Increase wake after sleep onset. Like we talked about that just a little bit earlier. It's just a realistic expectation. It might take you a little bit of time to go back to sleep. That's okay. Try to implement those suggestions that I made. Uh, decrease in slow wave sleep. Um, you guys probably as a patient won't notice that, but that's that really, really deep sleep. If you ever go to somebody, you try to wake them up, maybe you got to catch a flight somewhere and you just cannot wake them up. It's a really deep sleep. Kids sleep. Um, a majority of their night in slow wave sleep, it's really hard to wake them up. But there is a decrease in that, and then we understand that when we interpret your sleep study. And there's essentially no stage changes in stage one or two over age. Uh, awakenings or arousals, we kind of talked about that. It's just as you get to older, there's different things, the ailments that you might have to deal with, stress, maybe some pain control. Um, we get a lot of patients with back pain or hip pain. Try to implement body pillars and build body pillows and such that can aid with those comforts so that you're in a position that sleeps best so that that's good. But um, it is going to increase slightly as you get older. And that's what I spoke of about just having a realistic expectation that your sleep's not going to be as it was when you were younger. And this is just another graph about how sleep efficiency. So if you come in for a sleep study, we track how long you've been awake, how long you've been asleep, and what stages of sleep you spent the most minutes in. And then we divide that all in an algorithm and we get a sleep efficiency. And obviously 100% is perfect. And we like to keep people around above 77, 80% is quality sleep, anything less than that instigates that there might could, could be a problem and could be a sleep disorder. So as you get older, your sleep efficiency does decrease. So this is just to break down some common primary sleep disorders. Insomnia is one that you hear about a lot. Insomnia is a symptom. It's not necessarily a diagnosis, but in the world of sleep medicine, many, many people get diagnosed with insomnia. Generally, when I have somebody that comes in with insomnia, we do a deeper dive and a workup to figure out if there's any underlying problems that we could treat, like sleep apnea, periodic leg movements, that we could address that. Periodic leg movements is that creepy, crawly inability that you feel like you have to shake your legs when you're trying to sleep and you got to wiggle your legs or maybe you feel like there's 
ants or something on them and you got to fill up and you got to walk around the room and then you relax and then you have to go back and go back to bed. That is seen in a high population of patients with pain, back pain, with patients that have diabetes, neuropathy patients that have nerve pain, that can cause that disorder. And then sleep apnea is ability where the airway collapses and your breathing either stops or it reduces enough for your blood oxygen to drop and for you to awake. Those are the two. A certain amount of sleep apnea is normal under generally five events an hour. The two considerations for us that we take into account is did it wake you up and did your blood oxygen drop? Those are the factors. We want to keep your oxygen in a normal level and we want to keep you asleep. So if you're having these episodes, these short episodes of sleep apnea, but they don't wake you up and your blood oxygen stays okay, then they, the doctor may choose not to treat it. Some physicians use what's called a mandibular advancement. Your dentist can put a mouthpiece in and that can treat um, mild sleep apnea. And then another treatment for sleep apnea is called CPAP. It stands for continuous positive airway pressure. It's a mask that fits over your nose and allows you to keep your airway patent so that your breathing can continue. Um, less common in REM behavior disorder, if someone's had a post-traumatic event or a lot of soldiers have um, REM behavior disorder where they act out their dreams and such, if that's something that comes to you, you can bring that to the attention of your physician. That's important, um, especially if you're acting out, getting out, um, letting yourself out of the house. Those are something that you should bring to your attention. As you can see, the percentage, it's very rare, but it is it is a, a sleep disorder that we need to address. This is an example or a diagram on that sleep apnea that I talked about or a normal breathing pattern. You inhale and then it goes through to your lungs and you oxygenate your body, whereas someone where the airway collapses and there's no obstruction and then that's when your blood oxygen drops and then you will your brain will wake you up. A lot of questions I get is, if I have sleep apnea or I've been diagnosed with sleep apnea, am I going to stop breathing and not ever start breathing again when I sleep? No, your brain is built to wake you up and alert you and then your airway opens and then you start breathing again. However, you're not getting restful sleep because it's waking you up sometimes 60 times an hour, waking you up every so often, you're not going to get rest. The other consideration is if you do have sleep apnea and it's not being treated, it can lead to hypertension and cardiac problems, and those can cause some problems later on. So you, you don't want to ignore the sleep apnea if, in fact, you've been diagnosed with it. You want to get it treated. This is a, a picture of a sleep study, what we do here at TMC. The green arrow is your brainwave activity. That's how we distinguish if you're awake or asleep or if something wakes you up and you have an arousal. Um, the blue arrows, um, are they, they, they are the snoring patterns. So you can see this person is snoring pretty readily. And then the red arrows is the cessation of breathing, and that um, signifies an apneic episode. So this is what the text my staff look at to be able to diagnose if this is a transient problem or if this is something that maybe we need to treat. So that's what we're looking at, all those squiggly lines. Um, if, in fact, you're not happy with the way you're sleeping, we always start with getting a baseline and to have a sleep study and see if there's anything that we need to address or if we just need to go back to more sleep hygiene and behavior stuff and get you on a schedule. Uh, PLMs, that's a disorder where you feel like you need to move your legs. Um, certain medications can, can do that. Um, so if you have recently been put on medications like maybe an antidepressant or something, and you've noticed that you feel like your legs need to shake or need to move, bring that to the attention of your physician. Say, all of a sudden, I've got, I got to walk, I, I got creepy feelings in my legs, creepy crawly feelings, I need to walk. That's something to bring to the attention of the doctor. Sometimes they can do a medication change and um, help with that. Um, patients that have um, or use alcohol before bed, sometimes that can increase with the PLMs. And PLM stands for periodic leg movement syndrome. REM behavior disorder, we talked about that, where you're acting out your dreams. Um, a higher incident in men than women. 
Um, but definitely something if your bed partner, um, if that's something that's going on, bring that to the attention of them or their physician so that they can, and that is treated by medication. Um, consequences for poor sleep, especially patients in the aging population, um, it can increase depression, can make you very sad. Um, in the world of sleep, we try to maximize quality of life. We want you to sleep and get restful sleep so that you can go and do the things that bring you enjoyment. Um, I had a patient who was early 40s who had horrible sleep apnea and was really uncharacteristic because she wasn't the conventional person that was overweight or whatnot. She just had really bad sleep apnea, but she says, I'm really depressed because I'm not able to go with walks. I can't go shopping with my friends. I just don't have any energy. Once we addressed the sleep apnea and got her treated, she came back. She's very vibrant. She was able to live her life the way she wanted to. Things that brought her enjoyment. Um, in the elder population, I know, um, Keeping up with the grandkids is real important, being able to go to their events and, and see them. And if you're not sleeping well and you're tired and you're having to take naps, you're less likely to want to do those things or have the ability to do those things. So we definitely want you to, to not be complacent with poor sleep. We want to bring it to your attention to be able to advocate for yourself. And then, of course, the scary nature is that if you're not sleeping well and you fall asleep at the wheel, you can get into car accidents, um, accidents on the jobs, falls. Falls is definitely a big risk for um, when you're sleepy and your coordination is off and maybe your um, coordination is already compromised maybe by other problems. Like I said, we talked about hip pain or knee problems. So that's uh, definitely something to consider. And then the sleep apnea, we talked about hypertension. In the event that you've been diagnosed with hypertension, you've been put on one medication, maybe two, and you're still struggling with that, with getting that under control, maybe bring it to your, to your attention to your physician. Maybe I should have a sleep study. We're seeing more and more patients that have had, for whatever reason, uncontrolled hypertension, high blood pressure, and they realize that the hypertension is caused because they have sleep apnea. And if we treat this sleep apnea, they can come off the blood pressure medication. Same thing for diabetes. If you're having trouble controlling your diabetes because of that, Excessive breathing, that sleep apnea, trying to catch your breath, it's almost like you're burning your glucose while you're sleeping when you should be resting. So it's the same thing, we're able to um, get them off their diabetes medication. And that helps when we can address their sleep apnea. Um, this is just a breakdown of stuff that we've already kind of covered about sleep deprivation. It's really important to get restful sleep because it can lead to a slew of other health, heart problems, uh, obesity, diabetes, we just touched on, um, the depression we talked about. So it can then lead into other problems. If um, a lot of our patients don't view their sleep problems as a truth health concern, which we're trying to change by these classes and these things, is it is a valid health concern when you're not sleeping well. Most patients think it's just an inconvenience. You know, I'm tired during the day. But by this list, it, it leads, it can lead to some very significant things that we need to be addressed had you just addressed it earlier. Okay. Bedtime. So this is a checklist that we use in the sleep lab. We kind of already touched on some of these things where, you know, is the temperature of the room? Okay, you can utilize this checklist at home. Is your pain control? Did you take your pain medication? Did maybe you take some Tylenol because your legs are bothering you, your back's bothering you? Did you go to bed on time? If you're using CPAP, are you going to make every attempt to wear it? Try not to take those CPAP vacations. My dad, I wear CPAP. And um, he's like, well, I didn't wear it. I'm like, well, how long have you wear it? Like, a couple weeks. And he goes, I'm just dead tired. I couldn't even finish mowing the lawn. I said, you need to wear your CPAP every day. Okay. And then when he listens to me, he goes, you're right. I feel better. <laughs> I might know what I'm talking about. He is my dad. So is the television on? I'm not saying television doesn't bring comfort and relax you to relax. I do it too, but get to a point where the television gets turned off and then try to sleep. Don't fall asleep with it on. We talked about all those things. Are your pets in, in the room, in the bed? Is that where you want them to be? You know, if you have a, a particular, we have an older dog that sleeps at the, supposed to sleep at the end of the bed because he needs to go out in the night. 
but then sometimes he's just feeling vibrant and he wakes up five, six times a night and then we don't get any sleep. So we need to think about that. If that's, you know, if that's impacting your sleep, maybe get him a little bed out there in the front room and he can let himself out. So um, noise control. Sometimes we live on busy streets, whatnot. Um, so think about those noise machines, those white noises, fans. You don't have to point the fan on you because I know temperature is big, especially as we get older. So you can turn the fan to the wall and create that same noise um, without having that blow on you if that's not what you like. Um, toileting prior to bedtime, always a good idea to get in that habit where you train your bladder to not wake you up because it's empty. And then the lighting, is it reduced? We talked about that circadian rhythm. A lot of people, I was surprised how many people sleep with the lights on. Or maybe they fall asleep and they just haven't turned the lights off. Your brain really needs that lighting to be decreased. It increases that melatonin production and it will keep you asleep. Um, you can buy melatonin over the counter. I didn't really touch on that too much. Some of my patients ask me, you know, is that a good thing to do? I think that that's probably the best thing to start is it just helps increase that. Um, and then bring that, of course, to your attention to your doctor. But I don't see that, that the, the literature supports that some patients have had some really good success with that. Daytime, same checklist, a little bit different. Are you waking up on time? Did you do the walk? Did you go out? Do you expose yourself to sunlight or other light sources? Um, are you as active as you can be? Did you go, you know, make your own breakfast? Did you... Um, whatever that looks like. Did you go and play cards with your friends or did you do a little shopping? Try to be as active as you can because if you have a busy, busy eventful day, then you'll be ready for bedtime. If you haven't had so much structure and it's kind of sedentary, it's going to be really hard to, to go to bed. You're going to feel like I got all this rest in the world. And the more you bring that to, to people like you's attention, they're like, okay, that makes sense. Okay. And uh, eliminate the napping late in the afternoon. If you do nap, you know, try to set an alarm so you're not sleeping. Uh, a lot of my patients say, well, you know, I slept for three or four hours and now I can't go to bed. I'm like, well, you probably should have set an alarm, you know, limited to 20, 30 minutes instead of sleeping all that time because it is going to contribute. And then you're going to get into sleep. Um, sleep during the day and sleep at night are very different because of that circadian rhythm. And then decrease or eliminate your alcohol consumption. It is very common that alcohol disrupts sleep. Um, you don't get the normal sleep. It's very well documented. That, um, if you want to have a wine, you know, glass of wine with dinner or whatnot, that's fine, but it can affect your sleep. So another thing is to keep that diary. Do I feel like I sleep better when I maybe when I skip the glass of wine or whatnot? Yeah, I do. Okay, well then maybe try to limit that. Maybe have your wine earlier in the evening. Um, in conclusion. The sleep development, the sleep-wake cycles are, are age-dependent. So we talked about that and giving you some, some good information about kind of how that incorporates so that you can relate to that, maybe see how it fits in your own sleep cycle. Um, reduction in total sleep time, so wave sleep and REM sleep. As one ages, that's realistic. Um, sleep disturbances, um, it increases with age. And then as you start to get older, these sleep disorders can be more prevalent. It might be something you have to get further diagnosis on or bring to your attention to your doctor. It's not uncommon for them. Just because you've never had sleep apnea doesn't mean that it can't develop later in life. And I would open it to questions. We're going to do um, online questions first for Maya, and then we'll go to in-person questions. So, Maya, there's two. Yeah, I just have to I do want to ask you about... Um, you know, is there anything, like if you fall asleep, let's say you're watching TV, you fall asleep on the couch, you're there for a few hours, you get up and you move to the bed, is that any indication of anything besides more than just being tired? You know, should you, can you somehow stop doing that? What should you do? So that's a tough question. I agree. So I would say from personal experience as, as well as my patients that Falling asleep on the couch is probably not the best and conducive to sleep as opposed to your bed, okay? There's a lot of things going on out there. You're usually watching television. So is there a valid problem for why you're, no. I think that more of a structured routine is probably what I would exploit in that situation than, 
am I falling asleep on the couch and that means that I have sleep apnea? And no, I would just think to get more in a structured routine and put yourself to bed. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit more about the process if somebody does need a sleep study? So what, what do they need to do? Is it referral based or how does that work? Good question. So first and foremost, I would pick a physician that you trust, that you feel you can have a good conversation with and talk about some of these sensitive topics. I've touched on a lot of different things about pets and medications and bizarre behaviors and sleep apnea and stopping breathing. Someone that you trust that you can have those conversations with because the beauty of sleep is that any physician can order a sleep study. So if you are seeing a cardiologist and you have a good rapport with that physician, go talk to them. They are well-versed in, in sleep apnea and sleep disorders and can order the sleep study. If you have a PCP that you get along really well with and they're managing other facets of your healthcare, bring it to their attention. If you're, if you're a lady and you see a lady doctor and that's who you trust and you're talking about your hormones and stuff, they're well-versed in sleep. You can talk, they can order the sleep study. So my, and anyone can order it. What, um, what we use Epic as a medical record. Some of the physician's offices can just send us a request through Epic. Um, if it's an office that's not on Epic, then they can fax it to us. I have schedulers in the sleep lab. You can also call that number and we can get you those numbers if you want. And then you can talk to them and say, Hey, mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, um, I, I was going to put up on the screen here for home they would like more information to call the sleep lab the number is 520-324-3318 i know there is a different number for scheduling but i figure if they call you you can at least direct them to the right place when, actually we when, do all of our own scheduling now so actually we did change that within the last year so my schedulers are in the sleep lab so that 3318 number will get you to who you need to talk to I have three staff during the day that will answer your calls, answer your questions, and direct you as needed. So when they number. come in, so when they come in, they come in at what? What's the process as far as how long are they there, and what does that look like for that night? Oh, it's very comfortable. I mean, watch having somebody watch you while you sleep when you're not in your own bedroom. I mean, what could be better? So the normal process is we schedule. We can schedule a sleep study any time. However, 95% of our patients either come in at 8 p.m. or 9.45 p.m. And then you get hooked up to about two dozen different monitors. Some go on your head, some go on your throat, in your nose. They are what we call non-invasive. They don't hurt, but they monitor very important functions of your sleep. Belts around your chest to monitor your breathing effort. Pull socks on your finger for your oxygen. And then we do watch you and listen to you by the camera so we can um, document how loud you're snoring, if you're snoring, if you're talking. And then for safety, we watch you with an infrared so it's dark and watch you with a camera. If you need to get up to a bathroom, we just ask because there's so many wires and what have you, we don't want you to trip and fall. The staff member will come in, get you up, walk you to the bathroom, close the door. You'll have your privacy, you can use the bathroom, and then we'll put you back, get you hooked up back in. Um, if you ambulate or have trouble ambulating, we do have bedside commodes and they're all private rooms. Um, you will not be sleeping like that. I don't know if anybody saw that Seinfeld episode of a sleep lab one years ago. If you guys know who Seinfeld is, it's a show. Um, oh my goodness. They had like three or four people like cordwood long lined up having a sleep study all in the same room. It was a horrible episode. I have tried to undo that for years. That I've been the manager of the sleep lab. No, that's not what it's like. That's awful having to sleep with strangers. So ours are private rooms. They have a bedroom feel to them. It's not going to be like your room. We got sleep number beds. So the beds are very comfortable. People are liking the beds. They can go up and down, whatnot, what have you. Um, we got white noise machines. So if um, because it's located on Rosemont, sometimes there's a lot of traffic on Grant Road. We have white noise machines to try to condu help you conducive to sleep. What else? You'll sleep until you um, your normal wake time, which for us, we try to get about six to eight hours of recording time. 
So that means that we'll wake you right around five or six o'clock in the morning. You'll do some paperwork, ask, telling us how you felt you slept and what woke you up. And then the doctor gets all of that information and then interprets your sleep study. Okay, great. And are there also studies that work from home or do you, I know, I think you usually recommend that they come in to do it. And I'm so glad to hear about the sleep number beds. I think that's new if I'm not mistaken. Yes. The sleep number beds were new. Those was an initiative that we did last year. So patients didn't like the hospital beds. So, um, so yes, it is, there is a ability to do a modified sleep study at home. It's what we call a home sleep study. Unfortunately, not all sleep studies are created equal. So it has limitations. So I caution you, it is possible to have a normal home sleep study, but there still be a valid problem because we monitor and able to look at things a lot more in depth than just a four channel machine. Okay. However, some insurances require that you have a home sleep study first. Maybe some patients have come in and haven't been able to sleep at all at our facility, although it is comfortable, but they just can't, can't sleep. Then we will recommend that you try it at home and let's see what information we can get from there. Okay. But you do have that capability to be studied at home in more depth and more detail with more findings. You can come into the lab and have what we call an in-lab study. And for shift workers and people that sleep during the day, we're able to accommodate them as well. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate you being here and sharing everything that we need to know about sleep, particularly as we age. Um, I'm going to turn it over to your in-person audience and wrap up with our online audience. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here today. Our next top, a topic, which is part of our active aging series this month, is going to be preventing injury as we age. That'll be on Tuesday, January 24th at 10 a.m. Please give us a call in the office if you'd like more information or would like to tune in. The phone number here is 520-324-1960. Have a great day.